since like the very beginning of quarantine, we've all had to, you know, everybody has had to shift and pivot in different ways. And for me personally, it's definitely been, um, you know, for my book tour, since I was out on my book tour, when, you know, this whole thing started and came home and have really moved the whole entire book tour to being on social media, which has been really interesting and also really amazing because it's, you know, it's a book about forgiveness. So it's been really actually uh, a great way to connect with people on a personal level about a topic that's really complicated and not often that fun to talk about. So uh, it's been fun to find kind of find the silver linings in the whole uh, situation, I think. Yeah. Um, I know it's it's been interesting. I think you know, there's so many challenges, but there have been some wonderful things to come out of it. And I think taking the time now, I mean, I normally would never have time to sit down and be able to connect, you know, with fabulous women like this, inspiring women. Um, so for me, it's definitely given me a chance to slow down as well. So I think, as you said, definitely um, a silver lining in all of this. Yeah. Tell us a little bit um, about, before we get started into the questions, um, obviously, yeah, we've we've been dancing together for many years. <laughs> um, yes. But where, um, what, where did where were you inspired by, or what what made you want to write um, the gift of forgiveness? Well, I think really just feeling like in my own life, I was struggling with forgiveness. I had a really big falling out with one of my close girlfriends, and I was really struggling to. Um, to practice forgiveness and didn't really also know what forgiveness meant to me in my life in my mid twenties. And, um, and so I really felt like the most helpful way for me to get through that was talking to other people about their experiences with forgiveness and their struggles with forgiveness. And so I wanted to turn that into book form so people could learn from other people's journeys and struggles and, get inspired to welcome forgiveness into their own lives because I see so many people who really struggle with it at various phases in life and also um, trying to see what, you know, how to quickly practice forgiveness or how to get there really fast. And the reality is, is that there is no way to, there's no one way or right way or wrong way to practice forgiveness. There's only your way. And so I found that to be really encouraging and it made me want to kind of share a collection of different experiences and stories in my book because, uh, you know, everyone's relationship with forgiveness is so different. So to be able to share a good collection of stories was important to me so someone could see themselves in another person's story. Yeah. And the idea is that you don't want to have that moment of forgiveness on your deathbed. You know, you want, you want to be able to process all of that way before then. Yes, exactly. Um, all right. Question number one um, is how are you practicing self-care and how are you feeling um, during this time of isolation? Um, I'm definitely practicing self-care by getting up every single morning and making sure that I work out and stay active and continue some sort of a routine while I'm in quarantine, because I think that uh, I've never been able to sleep in anyway. Like my parents always growing up would wake me up really early. And I think because of that, I always, even though I don't live with my parents right now, I just always have this fear that I'm sleeping <laughs> in and wasting my day. <laughs> They're there at the end of the bed. Wake up. I know. So <laughs> I wake up early and I try to do um, my workout or go on a, a walk with a mask on and um, and just try to do something that's outside and staying active. And then I've been really doing most of like my work and podcasts. I'm working on a podcast right now with um, with Headspace that's kind of a continuation of my book, which is really exciting. And so I've been doing a lot of that since being in quarantine, but just really making sure that I also uh, don't try to keep too much, um, you know, if I don't get something done one day that I'm not too, you know, hard on myself about it and that I, you know, allow some flexibility. But I think having structure and a schedule during this time has been really helpful. And also I think, the self-care aspect of um, 
not only doing something good for your body and eating good food, because I love baking and I've been able to bake a lot since in quarantine, but um, I think just like really making sure that you take care of yourself and that you also nurture the relationships that are really important to you, because this has been a really amazing time, I think, for so many people to be able to connect to, you know, cousins or extended family members or, you know, uh, friends on the phone or, you know, FaceTime that we normally wouldn't have the time to do. So that's been a really big part of my self-care since I've been in quarantine. Mm -hmm. If there was one thing that stood out to you or one lesson that you've learned about yourself during this time of stillness, what would that be? Um, I think the number one, probably most challenging um, part about this whole experience for me has always been, has been just this lack of control and lack of uh, a plan. And I'm definitely a plan person. Like I'm, I like to have everything planned, uh, you know, very far in advance. And I think with a situation like this, obviously you just can't because there really is no plan. So I think just really letting go a lot of control with uh, life and plans and things that you had expectations for has been really eye-opening for me. And then also, I, I know that a lot of people miss certain routines, like going to coffee shops or going to restaurants mm -hmm. and things like that. And it's really shown me actually <laughs> how much I don't have that and how the real thing that like, I miss a lot of seeing, you know, like my girlfriends, of course, and um, and my family friends, but to me, the place that I really, uh, you know, frequent the most and miss the most not being able to go and just be like all the time there would be my parents' homes, um, which is nice to be able to go and have, you know, like social distancing walks and be able to have interactions that way. But I'm, as you know, so close with my family that that to me was like the first moment of panic when this whole thing started was how am I possibly going to go, you know, this long of time without being able to hug my mom or, you know, be around my, my brothers and my sister. And, um, and so that part of it was probably the biggest uh, eye opener for me in this time of stillness. Yeah. It's, it's like simplifying life, isn't it? In yeah. a lot of ways. And I think we keep talking about, you know, the spiritual journey and spiritual path is when you are present in the exact moment. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's easy to read books about that and to preach that, you know, but when we are in that situation, you have to like today, we, we can't control anything. We can't control what the virus is going to do, yeah. what the governor is going to do, what the, you know, so I think that for me, had, I've also found that it's been really hard just to be present, enjoy the moment. Um, and let go of control, let go of the reins. Yeah, I think also just like knowing, I mean, for me, it's also made me realize like how unnecessary so much of the stuff that we have in our home is. Like mm -hmm. that to me has been also really eye-opening because we're all in our homes for this whole time. So like you start going through things and you're just like, it makes you look at things in life and it's just like, there's so much stuff and it's so unnecessary and you know, what really matters in life is not all the stuff that you have and being able to like purge that is a really great part of this whole thing as well. What does your health and wellness routine and has, does it look any different now to what it is normally? Um, I mean, I would definitely say that we are eating much more at home than we did before. So there is not you know, like going to lunch or going to dinner or going out to get things or, you know, ordering something that's your favorite or, you know, going to people's houses, uh, which we used to do a lot of. So I think it's much more, you know, ordering or getting groceries that you can make different meals that work for you and that are healthy and that are, you know, feeding your body in a great place and keeping you in a really good place as well, uh, mentally, emotionally physically. So, and when I say we are making the meals, I mean my husband, <laughs> <laughs> which I'm very lucky. I'm so lucky. I, I do the baking, but he does all of the cooking. So I don't take that for granted at all. He's a very good cook. 
um, and and is we're experimenting a lot with different meals and things like that. But he definitely is taking the the load on the cooking for sure. So yes. that I'm very grateful for. It's very. My husband's the same. He's the cook in our family, and it's yes. so nice to be treated, you know, to meals. But the other thing I've discovered is, you know, we used to be. You know, especially in LA, it's like, oh, I'll meet you at you know so and so coffee shop, and all, yeah. you know you'll pick up Postmates and all of these things that we were like instant gratification, and now it's like, you know, back to baking again. <laughs> you know, we were like yeah. baking sourdough bread in our house. Like I know that would it's never have happened if this had you know COVID hadn't hit. So yeah, I think it's also like it's really empowering. I've found for myself and also a lot of my friends to know that you can like make sourdough bread at home and that you don't need to go to a bakery and you know spend thirty dollars or twenty dollars on a loaf of bread like these are all things that i think we just because they're convenient we go we go buy them um if we're able to and so this has also been like a really great time to experiment with different things and uh and just see what you're really capable of yeah a good reminder yeah all right what motivates you um, I would say what motivates me is definitely my family for sure. I think like they motivate me in everything that I do and also just being able to keep a really positive mindset and outlook and staying close and communicative with every single person and, um, checking in, I would say that's like a big thing for my family and um and in our relationship in our home is just being able to be super communicative about everything so i would say my family and my my loved ones are definitely what motivates me if you could go back to your younger self um what would you say to her well i definitely would not give any sort of a warning about quarantine yeah <laughs> um i think i would probably just say i would love to tell my younger self to not take everything so seriously and to just be more present and get excited about life. Because I think when we're younger, especially when we're in high school, we're very caught up in being in high school and, you know, paying attention to the things that matter, which is like, you know, your clothes or stressing over a Spanish test or, you know, those kinds of things. And my mom always told me when I was younger, and I would freak out about a chemistry test or Spanish or something like that. She'd always say, when you're, you know, in your twenties, no one's going to ask you what grade you got on your Spanish test. All you can do is try your hardest and put in the work. And, uh, and so I think I would probably want to have more of that outlook on life and just to get really excited about life moving forward. But I was always one of those kids who, even in high school, I was really excited to get older and to have experiences in life. And I think it's probably because I'm a little bit of a, an old soul in that way. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I'd probably just tell myself, tell myself that to be, you know, more present and to enjoy every moment. Yeah. What does success look like to you? Um, success to me really looks like having really great and solid relationships with my close friends and family. I think that to me, as I've gotten older, um, I think success looks like different, looks very different to every single person at different phases in life. And for me, um, you know, I take incredible pride in my books and being able to write and talk about things that are really important and talk to people that I think are really interesting and amazing. And, um, and, uh, and to be able to uh, do that is such an incredible gift because it's something that I'm really passionate about. And so I would say that I feel success when someone tells me that, that something I've done has allowed them to feel less alone or, you know, that, that uh, a story in my book has allowed them to welcome forgiveness into their lives. That makes me feel success. But I would say at the end of the day, being able to, look at my sister Christina, my brother Patrick and Christopher, and my mom and my dad and my husband, uh, and just say that I have really amazing, happy, love-filled relationships with them and also with my closest girlfriends and, and uh, the ones that I love. That's probably where I feel most success. Mm -hmm. Before we get to the last question, tell us a bit about um, your passion for animals. 
Oh my God, my passion. <laughs> my, my mom was actually talking about this last night at dinner because she was saying that um, when we were we were doing, uh, I went over to her house to drop something off, social distance, drop something off at her house for Mother's Day. And she was saying how when you're younger, when you're little, you know, you're this person when you're little and you have all these passions and these things that you really love. And then as you get older, you change and you shift based on, you know, what society tells you or what your friends say is cool and, you know, pressures and things like that. Um, but that, you know, what our true love is and what our true passions are, are really shown when we're little and when we're younger and how my, uh, my passion and love for animals has always been there since I was, you know, able to stand up is that I always wanted to be around all different kinds of animals and care for animals. And that when I was really little, my mom always thought that I would have <laughs> a preschool to take care of children with a bunch of animals. And was like, <laughs> yeah, all I wanted to do was like, be around children and animals. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I love being around, you know, all different kinds of animals. But I would say that, uh, you know, most importantly, I work with amazing animal rescue organizations that uh, offer to be a voice for the voiceless. And I have my rescue dog, Maverick, and it's just opened my eyes to a whole new world and community where, um, you know, people do such amazing work for all of the variety of animals that are available for adoption. And uh, this time, actually, in, in COVID and in quarantine, so many people have made the decision to adopt animals, which is such an incredible thing. Uh, and a great silver lining in this whole experience is that animal rescue shelters and organizations are organizations are really being able to, uh, you know, get a lot of dogs and cats and animals adopted out into forever homes, which is such a great and exciting part of this. And also, of course, there are many animal rescue organizations that are struggling incredibly because they can't be open and they don't have financing and things like that. So um, my passion for animals has been here since day one. And it's something that I will, you know, want to do forever is just being able to show people all of the amazing animals that are in the animal rescue world and to be able to always have that in their mind when wanting to make an addition to their family. And uh, I never like to criticize people who go to breeders or who like to you know, find a specific dog for them because every animal needs a home. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also like to be able to show that there are so many great dogs and cats and rabbits and things like that that are available in, uh, you know, waiting in adoption facilities for someone to give them a second chance at life. Yeah. And I guess during this time, those who have to self-isolate on their own, that's like extremely lonely. Yes. So that would be a time where you'd want man's best friend you know you'd want to, to have someone there with you so that's, yeah that's that's good news that at least um you know people are adopting still which is yeah. great um does maverick have his own book maverick does have his own book i <laughs> wrote a children's book um, a couple of years ago called maverick and me which was all about teaching children about animal rescue because it was something that i remember getting my first dog when i was little my sister and i and uh, and it was such a memorable and amazing experience. And I just uh, have had such a great a great joy having Maverick in my life, and also being able to take him on walks and see the way kids react to him because he's brindle and he looks like a little tiger. And just to see kids be really interested and fascinated in the fact that this dog came from the street and that he has a story and that um, you know he looks a little funny and he looks different. And it was it to me was such a great. Uh, a great opportunity to be able to write a book to teach mm -hmm. kids about, you know, that there are dogs that, you know, might be on the street or might be uh, in someone's home that need forever homes. And that when they get to a point in their life, when they want to ask for their first pet or get their first pet, that they might consider going to a, an animal shelter to adopt instead of buy. Uh, yeah. That's All right. Lucky last question. Um, if you could have five people at a dinner party, living or dead, anyone you want to invite, who would they be and why? Um, I mean, immediately I would just say to have dinner with my siblings, of course, because, yeah. <laughs> uh, and my parents, but that's more than five. Um, <laughs> just because I get such a, I have always had such a fun time with them, but I would probably say 
if it was living or dead, I would say that I would definitely have my grandparents for sure. I think it'd be interesting actually to have my grandparents from my mom and my dad come back and have like a dinner with them because it would be so different from each of their perspectives. And I was, you know, I spent a lot more time with my, my mom's parents growing up. Um, my dad's dad passed away before I was born and my dad's mom passed away when I was younger and she also lived in Austria. So she, you know, she would come over here for a long period of time, but we didn't get to spend that much time together. So I would say having probably my grandparents back would be a very interesting dinner table conversation. For sure. <laughs> a, chance, a chance to get to know them a little bit better. Yes, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Oh, well, that brings us to the end of Simone 7. Thank you. This thank was so fun. How are you doing? Are you, how's the baby? So cute. Um, obviously, it was Mother's Day yesterday, so we had Happy a really... Happy Mother's fun. Day. Yeah, thank you. It was, the, it was just a perfect day, and I think all of this um, has really taught me very much to just appreciate what I have, and, you know, I can't wait to see my mom. She's in Australia, and, you know, that's challenging because um i think i lost you for a second um you know because that's a long flight and i don't know when i'll be able to, to get on a flight to see her and i no. can't wait to squeeze her but um yeah i'm really just appreciating the time being at home and being able to really bond with oscar and and mark and yeah and thank god for facetime i you know, know having like I house know. parties and facetiming with everybody constantly Crazy. Yeah, I know. We're so grateful to have these, you know, these devices that can allow us to connect with people and also stay in touch with our loved ones who we're not able to be with. So we're, we're lucky in that sense, for sure. Yeah. Oscar's, you know, one and already he understands that the phone, you know, when, the, when we're on FaceTime, he's like, hello. hello. Yeah, it's very cute. That's yeah. so sweet. Well, thank you so much for having me. My this. pleasure. So thank you for coming on. You have a wonderful love. Bye. 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 Bye.